Thank you, Eve. There's so many uh, heroes of the Everglades here, and the people, uh, there's too many to count, and Betty, and then my friends in the media, Louie and Channel 10 is, probably has the best environmental coverage of any local station I've ever seen. And, and where I live, I don't get, I, no, it's really, where I don't get Channel 10 anymore, but when I'm here, that's who I watch. Uh, and my dear friend, Michael Putney, is, is here. And uh, uh, someone said, you, how, do you, how do you live in Florida and think of it without the Everglades, or not translate that into not fight for the Everglades? Um, we talked about generations, and, and, and Betty was talking about some of this too, and what, what the next generation of, of warriors is going to be, because we need them. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm lucky because my uh, son Scott is here, and his wife Jenny Stiletovich just did an incredible uh, multi-part podcast about the Everglades for WLRN that was fantastic if you didn't get to see it. And then my uh, granddaughter is down in Big Pine diving on a reef or something today for FAU. She's going to be a marine biologist. So, um, and yet all that, and I'm still pissed off. And uh, <laughs> that's going to be my message today. It's real simple. Stay pissed off. You know, I that was I missed the column in the sense that in, when you're in the newspaper business, or you're in the media, you write something and it's immediate. You get it's it's timely. It's in. It's done. Um, and, and when novels, it can be, you know, from the time you write something to the time you see it can be a year, and it doesn't have the same adrenaline rush as uh, the newspaper business did. The commissioner, by the way, who did get that resolution passed uh, condemning who he was, you might have heard of him, Joe Carroyo. Um, yeah, I really did a number on him, huh? He's gone. They really, they really are, and I say this affectionately like cockroaches. I mean, you could, <laughs> unless you get them right by the head and squeeze uh, right under them. Um, Betty was talking about putting your life on the line. And in this, I, I don't mean to, I'm not going to aggrandize what I did, but I did put my life on the line. About three days ago, I was in a, we were in a car, we're going from, um, Everglades City up to towards I-75, and we're on that stretch of State Road 80, uh, 29, and there was a big soft shell turtle crossing the road, so we pull over. When I was a kid, I could handle a big soft shell turtle. I'd forgotten uh, a few salient facts about them, but I was gonna lift him up by the rear legs, you know, and by the little rear legs, and just move his ass across the road. It's State Road 29, there's trucks coming, you know, and, uh, my wife was skeptical about the project, but I said, look, it, there's no cars, there's no trucks coming in either direction. And he had just crawled out of this big slime pond uh, off of 29. And I didn't reckon, now he's all covered in slime. I think I can still handle him. I pick him up and I've still got some marks. And he clawed the shit. I, I've got to say, <laughs> I admire him for it. But at the same time, I'm looking, being the selfish human, I thought this is going to make a terrible headline. If I get hit and killed on the road, because this soft shell, he'll be gone. He'll be back in the water. I'll be lying here. I don't know why I was here. Anyway, I got him off the road. I wanted to bring that up because I think that everybody in this room would stop their car and help that, that turtle across the road. I wish everybody in Tallahassee thought the same way. Um, and I will say one thing about the Herald is they let me... I don't want to say get away with stuff, but they let me speak the truth or whatever I thought the truth was in my brain. And every spring would come around and I would sort of regularly refer uh, to the legislature as a um, festival of horrors. And they let me use that language in the Miami Herald <laughs> until I realized that I, I was insulting whores. <laughs> And I stopped because I thought, wait a minute, there's no game with it. Tallahassee is all a game. This is what I'm talking about, staying pissed off. It is all a game and it's all about money and it's all, it's, it's all transactional. And when I started writing for the Herald, when I started in the newspaper business, which was a long time ago, the Everglades was not an issue that all politicians were talking about at all. It was not a uh, mom and apple pie issue. It is now. Everybody who runs for president 
of the United States or runs for a state office, a state uh, or a Senate or a House, everybody now comes to South Florida to preach about how much they love the Everglades. And the truth is we don't really care, do we, in our hearts if they do love the Everglades because there's no chance that they do. But they know that, no, they have to make an appearance. They have to go down to the Anhanga Trail and there's, you know, the little boardwalk and there's a little chamber of commerce, alligators and shit. And they have to do, the, and they, they put on, like DeSantis has these little green, kind of a green ranger suit that he puts on without the lapels, you know? It's, and, and here's the deal, it's been pressed. It's got like razor creases in this, you know? And he's gotta go out there and I love the ever, the truth is, if they do the right thing, we, we don't give a rat's ass if they care. The chances are they don't care. They, don't, they know very little. Many, many politicians do care, and those are the ones that are getting things done. But it's been interesting in my lifetime to watch the Everglades go from sort of an obscure political, really a South Florida issue. And even then, in the abstracts, there's so many people that had moved here. You know, I grew up in a, in a part of West Broward that had been in the Everglades, and I didn't know that for most of my childhood. All I knew is that you got on a bicycle and you rode a few miles and you were in the swamp. And it was the coolest thing ever, but it was later when I learned in some of the hydrology and, and, and that, that Tom Van Len can talk about that, because when it rained, the whole thing flooded. And we thought, gee, why is it flooding? What happened? Mom, Dad, why did you buy this house? And well, you, you bought it in the Everglades, so it's, going, it's supposed to flood out here. Um, and uh, and I, re I remember in Plantation when I was growing up, and I, honestly, that was, that's the name of the place, Plantation. <laughs> I, went, I went to Plantation High School, the mascot, and I swear to God, the, the Plantation High School colonels. Colonels. Okay. We, we were oblivious, um, but when I was growing up, there was one police car. There was the chief and the officer. There was only one cop in Plantation, the chief. He was a chief, an old Ford. He had 1956 Ford. And whenever there was a snake in the yard, my mother, who was born in Chicago, my dad was born in Fort Lauderdale. He didn't, he, snakes didn't bother him, but he was at work. Whenever there was a snake, my mother would call Hank, Hank Donut, the chief police, and he would come out to our yard to shoot the snake. That was like a ritual in our... And I, I guess why I started collecting snakes, maybe some passive aggressive thing with my mom. Uh, I'll, the therapist will sort that out. But in any case, I like snakes. But I never forget, oh, we had to come inside, Hank's coming, and he'd come out and he'd hear, bam! And, he'd, and we had an above ground septic tank. Also very good for the environment, I found out. And for some reason, water moccasins took, a, they liked the septic tank. I don't even know why. They weren't getting in it, but they were, they were always around the septic tank. So Hank was shooting them, and, the, and then the trunk of his old Ford would pop open, and he'd carry the dead snake, and he'd drop it in and drive off. And that was, you know, those are my sort of Norman Rockwell memories. <laughs> oh, Hank's coming to shoot another snake in the yard. But to this day now, when I go back to that if I drive by, which I don't do very often because it'll make me sick to my stomach, but if I go back to those old neighborhoods and see what's happened, when I was within, I remember one time, I, I wasn't even sure I wanted to come back and work in South Florida. I was working at a newspaper in Central Florida and, uh, and there was a family situation, so I wanted to come home and be with my mom. And I, I remember uh, just coming back thinking about, this isn't gonna be good for my mental health. Because the change, every time I would come back from college, every time I would come back to see my family, the amount of concrete that had gone down between the time I left and the time I got home was, uh, just made me heart sick. And it was, seemed like it was, when the time I grew up, we didn't, this is a true, I mean, this really dates me, but we didn't, there, was no, there were no malls in West Broward County, and you're free to laugh at that. Let me repeat, there were no shopping malls. <laughs> University Boulevard, you could ride your bike down and, and you, you didn't even have to worry about getting hit by a car. And now, so I remember coming home one time and just for the hell of it, driving from my mom's house to where I used to go out and catch snakes and go fishing and everything, where I used to ride my nine shopping malls. 
And this is in a, I mean, I'm not that old. This was in a relatively short period of time, and that's the kind of pressure. I mean, in Broward, they just, they just rolled over and let everything happen. I mean, the Broward County Commission, if any of you were ever on the Broward County Commission, shame on you is all I'm gonna say. <laughs> they were the biggest collection of, uh, and, it, and the thing is they were cheap. You could buy them all pretty cheap. That's what was the offending thing was. People from Newark and people from counties in Chicago that really knew about corruption would come down and thought, are you kidding me? That's all it takes to get your vote, honestly? Dinner at Chuck's Steakhouse? Oh, okay. I mean, they're used to like real graft. And they, they were amateurs down here. They were boneheads. Oh my God. And they got more sophisticated and there were stocks and they could move cash around. But at first it was just, oh, it, it was so easy. And now when I go and, and the irony, I, one of the first columns I wrote for the Herald uh, was about a road called the Sawgrass Expressway that they wanted to build. And this was being built, and the Broward County Commission put this forward as, it has nothing to do with wanting to encourage further development in the western part of Broward County. This has to do, this is actually, we're trying to save commuters trouble by going around the, the urban mass, the cities, and just go out west, and so give people an easier way to get around the cities. But we're, it's not all about building. I said, oh, and I had written a column suggesting that they were um, lying about that. And uh, now if you've ever driven the sawgrass, they've built all the way up to the conservation area dike, as far as they could build. And this was the coup, de, this is how I knew that my, I really accomplished something in journalism. And not, the, not only did they do that, they put a professional ice hockey arena right next to the Everglades, right next to the Everglades. And that, that is like a giant middle digit to every environmentalist. Oh, not only are we gonna this is all supposed to be Everglades. We're gonna build on it, and then we're gonna put a hockey, of all things, an ice hockey arena. And God bless the Panthers. But then they name it after a species. There's more hockey players than there are frickin' Panthers. I mean, anyway, this is what I mean. So I'm pissed off. I, I can't, I'm not supposed to go on much longer. Anyway, my message is, yeah, my poor Scott, poor Scott, his friends ask, so he gets asked sometimes, is your dad mellowed? <laughs> he burst out laughing. He says, he's worse. He's getting worse every day. But this is what it takes. This is the kind of feral energy that it takes to get things done and to stop bad things from being done and to see a room full of people who are so committed, not just with their checkbooks, but with their energy and their heart and their, and their passion about um, this incredible place. There is, as Marjorie Stoneman Douglas said, no other Everglades. And you don't have to hang out there. As a matter of fact, she was not that fond of trips to the Everglades. I knew her a little bit. There's a famous picture of her, and Louie knows what I'm talking about, where they get her in a dugout canoe. You've never seen a more miserable looking person <laughs> in their whole life. She looks like, if you gave her a choice between the dugout canoe and Saks Fifth Avenue, boom, Marjorie is gone. But the point is that she was willing to do whatever it took, and that, and for her case, was putting her life on her line. She couldn't stand mosquitoes, she hated mosquitoes, but all that, but she is an, just in this incredible warrior and this voice, and she understood without hanging out there, like a lot of us did when we were kids, she, she understood what it meant and the importance of it. And uh, the fact that you can f fill this room with so many people who feel the same thing is just uh, amazing. And, it, and I'm not a hopeful person, I'm not a positive person. I, I, think, I, think, I think we're all doomed, but I, <laughs> but I will say that the, the, this and, and the fact that there are generations of uh, your kids and your grandkids, my grandkids and my kids who are just as pissed off but they're actually chan channeling it in a socially acceptable way, which I've never been able to do. I think that gives us all hope. And, and thank you for, for, um, for having me here. And please keep up the fight. And just stay angry at these bastards, okay? Thank you.